Hi, everybody. Uh, I have a very special person uh, that I have the opportunity to talk to today. And this is Jonathan Ames, and he played Jergison in Moonlighting. He was one of the staff that didn't get a chance to talk too much, but today he's finally going to get a chance to talk, and you're finally going to get to hear his voice. So thank you so much, John, for joining today. Thank oh, sure. My, my pleasure. Us. As you can see, I have a special background. <laughs> There's yeah. John there. There I am. Looking uh, right, yeah, it's next to the lady with the white dress over there. And this is My Fair David. Yep. Great episode. Yep. Lots of terrific comedy. This is the episode where you guys uh, did the limbo. And almost got fired. Now, if you notice, I don't have a mustache there. I had a mustache most of the time, but for some reason, I think it was because I had to shave it off for some other job that I did not get, as a matter of fact. But then I had to, you know, I had to do this rest of this episode with no mustache. So it was kind of, I look different. That's funny because, yeah, you usually have a mustache. Yeah. You remember well, you, yeah, I do. I, even Glenn noticed that I didn't have it. He looked at me and said, did you have a mustache? I said, and I told him the story. And he said, oh, okay, I get it. But, you yeah, know, it was kind of funny. Do you remember, and the scene, do you remember filming it with Bruce? Oh, sure. Do you want to talk about a little bit about that? Well, I mean, you know, we we we, we just kind of goofing off because I guess the whole story was that we were just there to goof off the whole time. You know, of course, Bruce David tried to enlist us in all of his hijinks and all that stuff. And so that's what we were doing. The only thing about this this scene that, that kind of reminds me of is there's a guy, the guy that's standing over on the on the left hand side is carrying the, the lamp. There's a guy named Will Nye. And he was he was a guy, no, the other side. On the other side. Red hair. <laughs> kind of looks like a bigger McGillicuddy. He was the guy that they would bring in whenever there was a line for an office staff person. Instead of giving it to one of us because they didn't want to have to pay us, they would have him come in. And of course, you never saw him any other times except when he was going to be there for like one day to deliver a line, and then you never saw him ever again. And it was just kind of it was kind of funny. We we did it. We had we had fun. We would we were dancing. We were hopping, and Bruce was having a good time. You could see him up on the desk in the back. Yeah, it was a good time. And then that, we almost got fired because I guess Maddie made a deal with him that if he couldn't be an adult, then he had to fire two of us. And that was me and, uh, and O'Neill. But he didn't. No, he didn't. Out of the kindness of Maddie's heart, she changed That's right. her mind. <laughs> but he would have made her limbo, though. Yes, <laughs> he definitely would have. Uh, we have some really terrific questions uh, from the Moonlighting fans. Mm -hmm. Uh, with our Facebook page here, uh, moonlighting21.com, which uh, is uh, stands for uh, our website, moonlighting21.com. Quick background on myself. Uh, my name is Joy Choden, and I'm the founder of the Moonlighting Reunion Campaign and the DVD Campaign. We did the Moonlighting Strangers fanzine. This is before social media. We were highly responsible for um, inspiring Disney to release all five seasons of Moonlighting on DVD and it was released in 2005 and the 18 year anniversary just passed. Wow. What happened to the props on Moonlighting? Chris wants to know. Well, they were mostly, oh, they were the property of the props people. Um, so they probably kept most of them. I do have, I have one of the, the episode that, that, um, that Whoopi Goldberg was on, I guess Bruce got her or, or Addison got her a box of business cards. And I think there were actually a couple of them that she made up, but I happened to get one that, that, that has, I think it says David Addison on it. And I, I kept one of those. Actually, I kept two of those, but I think I sold one on eBay years and years ago. But most of the stuff belonged to the props people and they just, you know, they would just reuse it on other shows or whatever. And they were always constantly, you know, building up their, their, their supplies of stuff. And, you know, um, I used to go to New York every once in a while to visit my parents and I would go to these flea markets and I would, I would pick out watches because they at their at their request. The only thing the only thing was you know it had to be like you know they were all dummy they were all you know fake watches. But the only thing was I had to make sure I was able to buy two of them because they always needed to have a backup in case something happened to the original one. Mm -hmm. So I you know, I got them some you know Philly Patek and some Rolexes and some some all the bunch of other stuff. So you know I you know I had a nice relationship with them too. Which actor did you get along the best with on Moonlight? Like the main, the main, you know, um, Sybil, Elise, Curtis. 
Uh, you know, I would say Curtis. I had a nice relationship with 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 Elise and also with Bruce. But you know, I, I, we had a relationship with, with Curtis outside of the show. We were all Disney fans, and we used to go to Disneyland together. Me and 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 Dan and and Curtis. Um, we went a few times with some of the other people, like Jamie, and some of the other people went with us also. But it was basically the three of us that were really into it, and. So we, we became friends outside of the outside of the show. Probably Dan more so because they were both from Detroit, and they, you know they they sort of had a little bond that, that I didn't have with them. But they we, we spent a lot of time outside the show together. It was kind of fun. Yeah, and, and Dan and I had to act like his bodyguards because people still knew him from Revenge of the Nerds. So all these little kids were like looking at him. We're standing in line on a ride, and all the kids are looking. I know you. And then all of a sudden, he, you know, he'd want to go to the men's room and one of us would have to go with him because invariably somebody would just not assault him, but, you know, not leave him alone either. So it was uh, it was fun, though. We had a good time. We had a good time going there. Yeah. Well, to this day, Curtis is known for his role as Booger. And yes, uh, I, I know. The nerds <laughs> movies. He's never going to get rid of that. <laughs> no. And I, and I used to joke with him. I'd say, you know, you're going to win an Oscar. You're going to do all this Shakespeare stuff. And on your obituary, it's going to say, best known for playing Booger in the... Uh... <laughs> So. I, yep, yeah, that's, yeah. Who was your favorite guest star? Oh, I had a few. I, you know, I really liked Charlie Rocket. He was a he was a good guy. We he worked on the show a lot. I also really liked. You know, I know people didn't like the Walter Bishop character, but Dennis Dugan was a was a really good guy. We, we he became part of the family. He started directing, and you know, Dan and I would have lunch with him almost every day at the commissary, and and it was fun. I really liked I really liked Mark Harmon too. Mark Harmon was a really nice guy. He just was a regular guy. You know, you wouldn't think that, but he just was, you know, we'd go to lunch and we'd talk about, you know, cars and girls and sports and stuff like that and it was just um it was kind of a nice thing. And he was around he was around for I think at least a month. Yeah, but he was he was a nice guy. Yeah, I, you know, a few other people were I liked I liked Paul Sorbino who played David Sr. And Robert Weber, who played Maddie's dad, there were, a few, there were a few. It's been a long time, so I'm trying to I'm trying to put that all back together. But those pretty much were the, were the ones I really really liked. What was your favorite scene to tape? I think if I have to pick one scene, it's got to be the good loving scene in Atomic Shakespeare. You know? Yeah. Because because we had something to do with doing the way it was going to be done. And Will McKenzie was always willing to take input from from anybody with, if they had a better idea. The original script had Bruce running down the aisle and, and then coming jumping back on the tops of the pews back to the altar. And he said, you know, I could do this one time, but if I had to do it a second time, I'm going to probably break my neck and break a leg and stuff. So I went to Will and I just said, you know, Dan and I and Willie, Willie Brown was the other guy from the office. I said, you know, we could run down the run down the aisle and have Bruce run down and jump into our onto our shoulders, and we can carry him back up so that no one's going to get hurt. And he said, "Can you do that?" I said, "Yeah, sure. You know, not not a big deal." So we rehearsed it. It worked out pretty well, and it ended up in in, in the in the episode. I felt pretty good about that. Yeah, it's almost like they're hoisting him. You know, you're hoisting him over your shoulders, like you're our hero. You finally married her off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah, you know, that's what it, that's my impression when I watched that scene. <laughs> I know there was, you know, there's all this, you know, uh, talk with the show that you guys never got to talk because um, the writers were too cheap to pay you guys. So what was the, the truth here? Why um, you guys hardly ever got to talk? Well, the problem was the, the writers actually wanted us to talk because every once in a while a script would come down and there would be lines for um, for office worker. It didn't specify who because I guess because the way the Screen Actors Guild works, if you specify a character, then it becomes a character. And then it's not, you know, we were initially hired as extras and stand-ins. And there's a big difference between being an extra and being an actor. And, you know, a lot of money difference. They had been told, I guess they had called the, the Screen Actors Guild to find out what they could do with us. And at the time, they got the wrong information. They, somebody told them that if you let them speak once, you'll have to keep them on forever. As long as they're on the series, they're going to be that, that character and you'll have to pay them as actors. And, of course, they didn't want to do that. They would, you know, they had a good deal with us just being 
stand-ins and extras. It took two years of you know finagling, calling the Screen Actors Guild, calling the producers, and then and and trying to get them to call SAG, but this, they, they wouldn't call SAG because they thought that they had the right answer. So I would call SAG, and then they would say, "Well, no, they have to call us." So it was like this roundabout thing for about two years. Finally, a scene came out. Um, I mean, uh, uh, it was um, I think it was Father Knows Father Knows Last, I believe, when, when all the all the stuff is disappearing from the office. All they're carrying all the furniture out, and we haven't been paid, and he hasn't. And David hasn't been seen, and you know who knows how long he hasn't been seen. There were four. There were lines for four different office members. So I went over to the associate producer, a guy named Chris Welch. He was a nice, very nice guy. And I said, "Why don't you have us do that?" And everybody said, "Well, you know, blah blah blah. Uh, we can't do that because then we'd have to keep you on, and then, you know." So I said, well, do me a favor. If you, if somebody could call the Screen Actors Guild and ask them what the deal is, and they'll set you straight. Because they, they actually did call to find out if we could have, if we could do the lines off camera, so that you really didn't know who was doing it, but you just heard these voices instead of having the, you know, the looping group add the voices in later at some point. Just have us do it. So they called, and that's when they found out that they could actually keep us on for that episode. And once the episode was over, we go back to being extras until the next time they wanted us to talk. And so that from that point on, it got a little got a little bit better for us. So that's that's basically the story. It wasn't even I mean, the writers writers kept trying to give us stuff to do, which was kind of nice actually because they really they liked us. So, so they're extremely talented. Oh, uh, um, yes, unbelievable, incredible what they did with the show. Yeah, uh, Bruce and Sybil were both so you know. Um, you know, popular. Um, do you remember any like memories with like any fans, like crazy fans, or you know? Well, um, I know that I know that Bruce used to get a lot of mail from women sending suggestive photographs and all <laughs> kinds of stuff. And I don't know, you know, who knows whatever happened to all those photographs. But after a while, it became very difficult to be him. He, you know, he was. You know, you, you, once you become famous, you can't you can't go to the 7-Eleven and go get a quart of milk. You know, I mean, it's like, you, you know, you have to sort of think about it. And a lot of times he wanted to keep being a regular guy and he just really couldn't. And so they had they had security around. He would, and he was always aware if he saw a, an unfamiliar face on set, he always walk, would walk over to somebody and say, who's that over there? Um, and so he was always, always very aware of what was going on. I don't know of any specific any specific instances, but I'm I'm sure that there probably were that we never knew about. I there was even a rap song that said I get I get more chicks than Bruce Willis or something like that. Um, <laughs> he was yeah he was a sex symbol in his day that's for sure. Oh uh, yeah. Let's see. I he even was on some of the teen girl magazines. Even I yeah saw. that was I thought he was a little bit old for that, but that, yeah. You know. <laughs> Yeah, a little, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> what What do you remember was one of the funniest things that happened on set that wasn't in in the script? Nancy wants to know. Well, I think the one of the funniest thing was um, when um, the, the quarterback from the, the Chicago Bears, Jim McMahon, was coming to visit. I'm not sure if they he, if they were friends with if he was friends with Bruce, but there was a whole big thing going on at the time where he wanted to wear a headband that said. I forget what it said. It, says, it had the name of some brand of, of sporting wear or whatever. And Pete Rozelle at the time didn't want him to do it. So then he put on a, 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 a headband that said Rozelle on it, which was, I guess, you know, a dig at Pete Rozelle, who was the commissioner at the time. So he came, I'm not sure what the circumstance was, but he came to visit the set and we all greeted him with, headbands it said mcmahon on it somebody had made up these headbands and the place just went when became a ride it was very very funny but uh yeah bruce has that on his he's wearing that in the beginning of yes. uh, every daughter's father is a virgin yes yeah yeah you're right he, he, yeah that we but we all we all had those on he you know he just kept it that was probably the day we did that do you remember this episode with um whoopi goldberg oh sure camille yep, yep. Uh, what was it like working with her? Well, you know, at the time she was like this, like shooting star. I mean, she was, she was on TV. She was on Broadway. She was here. She was there. She was doing all kinds of stuff. And 
I guess um, um, my guess is that Bruce, I think, knew her from New York or knew of her from New York. And, you know, I know he was probably a struggling actor there also. And I guess he was able to get her to come on the show. I, you know what? She was she was she was fun. She was. And I actually ran into her years later. I was working as a as an extras coordinator on a film that she was working on. And we got to relive a couple of the things, which was that was kind of nice. It was kind of nice running into her. And she was very, very nice to me. And there were some other people like, what was this, um, Judd, Judd, uh, Nelson. Judd Nelson, yeah. So there were there were a few people there that were, um, you know, very, you know, hip and happening at the time. And that, that was, yeah, she was great, but, she, you know. Is uh, Sybil Shepherd anything like Maddie? How did they get the parts? Anne wants to know. How did they get the parts? What does that I mean? Know. I don't know. <laughs> how, did, how did Sybil become Maddie? I think that they... I think that they had her in mind. Yeah, they did. Um, but yeah, was she at all like Maddie? Like Maddie is very, um, she's not spontaneous and she's very, you know, by the book and all that type of thing. Um, I would, yeah, I would think that, yeah, she was probably a, a bit like that. I mean, she, you know, she was always, you know, the the the, the, uh, the cool blonde that, that was, you know, uh, kind of like the, in the, in the, the form of like the women, the women that used to work for Alfred Hitchcock, they were all like these kind of like ice cold blondes and they were all severe and, you know, and I think that was kind of like, but, but they may have been going through. I mean, I don't know for sure. She, yeah, I mean, she was, she was pretty much, pretty much like that, I would say. And uh, Bruce Willis said that the rehearsals were sometimes fun, even funnier than the show. Do you have any memories of that? The um, rehearsals? You know, I don't have any specific memories, but I know what he's talking about because everybody would do, they would all do with their ad libs and, you know, everybody, everybody thought that they were funnier than the writers and then they would try, but then of course, you know, um, they would try to get them to stick to this, the actual script. But I mean, yeah, we had, we had a lot, we had a lot of fun. That was a, that was a, a full-time job almost for five years. So, I mean, it was, it was, and then, you know, you, you know, the old cliche, it was like a family, but it, it was like a family because everybody, you're spending more time with these people than, than anybody else in your life. You know, sometimes 14, 16 hours a day. And it, it's, uh, it takes its toll on you after a while. But it, it was, I, I'm trying to think of anything specific. But I mean, it was just, it was, it was fun to be there most of the time. Yeah, the question from uh, Judy, um, with all the talk that it was stressful and everything. Mm -hmm. Did you you you, were, you did enjoy work working on the show? Oh, it was a great job. I mean, it, it was stressful and it was difficult. I mean, because of the hours and the you know, I remember I remember working. Usually, what they would do during the holidays, they would take two weeks off between you know Christmas and New Year's and give everybody kind of a break. But we were always so far behind that we never got to do that. Bruce and Sybil did. That's why they always ended up having those other episodes with you know Elise and and Curtis. I remember working until eight o'clock on New Year's Eve because they had to get this this thing done, and I and people were people were really angry. But that's that's the nature of the show. It's the nature of the business. What episode was that? Do you remember? Oh God, I don't remember. It would it would have been one of the it would have been one of the Christmas episodes. No, I guess it wouldn't have been. It would have been something after that because they would have they would have done the Christmas episodes probably sometime in the fall. November. You know, I mean, prior, you know, obviously prior to it, but you know, I honestly I can't remember. But I, people were really mad, they were angry because you know, you know, can't blame them. So it sounds like a wonderful job when the the staff is mad at Maddie because they have to work during Christmas. Oh, there's there's there you go. There's the parallel. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 very true. Let's see. Um, hmm. Uh. Okay, so going into the fifth season, um, mm -hmm. were you? What was the situation with season five? Because we've heard that, you know, they both kind of didn't want to be there. Sybil had yeah. just had twins, and Bruce just did Die Hard. He was becoming a superstar. Yeah. Um, what was the atmosphere? What was the feeling like on the set in season five? Well, I don't think I don't think we went into it um expecting it to be over but i think at some point after the maybe the first couple of episodes i think the writing was on the wall um that 
that they didn't want to be there. Yeah, you're right. Bruce had this gigantic film career that was burgeoning. Um, Sybil thought she did. She did a couple of films, but nothing, but nothing really turned out. But she ended up coming back to television a couple of years later. They just really did not want to be there anymore. You know, they would they would stay in their trailers and they wouldn't you know they would take their time coming back from lunch and to the point where it would they would what they would do is they would shoot all of their scenes before lunch as long as it took um and then when they were done they would break for lunch release bruce and sybil and then we would go back and do the coverage of all the other actors and whatever other scenes had to they, it meant going back to doing scenes that they had already filmed on but they had to go back to because they knew that it, if, if they broke for lunch, it would be at least two hours before they would come back out. And so they figured it was easier to do it that way instead. So you guys didn't know, when did you guys know that you were getting canceled? It's kind of vague. I mean, I know at some point, probably about halfway through, I, I figured we, we, we sort of knew. I'm not sure if we ever were really told until like, the you know, towards the really end. You could tell, you could just tell that the writing was on the wall. You know, that they didn't want to be there. They wanted to move on. And, you know, that's the way it was. I mean, they would sort of be disruptive in certain ways and kind of felt bad for some of the some of the guest stars because they they never got to do their their scenes opposite the actors they did with originally. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, you know, so that means that they would go back to, to film their coverage. To, they, like, you know, they're they're close up and they would end up doing it with you know, someone like me or the script supervisor or somebody else reading the lines off camera, you know, to, to me, that's like, that's, that's not, that's a slap in the face to an actor. Cause you know, I, I had seen people like Robert De Niro work and, and he was, he was there for every other actor that was there. Every actor that was there for his close up, he was there for that actor's close up as well. And he did it just as, just as well as he did it for his own stuff. So, you know, I mean, it was a difference. Which movie was that? That was a film called Guilty by Suspicion. He played a, um, a film director that gets blacklisted in the early 50s and he has to go testify in front of Congress and he, has, he doesn't want to name names and so he gets uh, he gets into trouble that way. Was there ever, did you know any talk about a reunion? Because that was, you know, we, we tried um, yeah. to make that happen. I, you know, I, I think... I think it was kind of like more of a slice of life from the from the, the mid mid to late eighties that you know like you know who wanted who nobody wants to see them in it, when, in their sixties you know what I mean it's like I mean we would have done it I I don't know if they would have asked us to do it but I'm, you know we would have I would never I never I never heard any any serious talk about it. You know, because like I said, we were still friends with I was still friends with Curtis and and I don't I don't ever recall him ever mentioning it. Well, I know Glenn was open to it because uh, we talked to him uh, mm. and Sybil was very excited about it. Um, oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I even um, communicated with her personal assistant uh, mm -hmm. back in the day. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, she was very excited about it. She oh, really wow. wanted to do it. Yeah, Elise was open to it um, and so was Curtis. So mm -hmm. the opportunity was absolutely there. That's too bad. I mean, it would have been would have been fun to see, even if whether we were part of it or not. It would have been nice to be part of it, but you know, we were, we were the ones that sort of got lost in the shuffle every once in a while. So yeah, well, you know, there's been so I don't know if you've ever read any of it, but there's been a lot of wonderful moonlighting fan fiction. Um, oh yeah, I read some of it. Yeah, a lot of them envision Maddie and David still working in Blue Moon. <laughs> And the staff is still there. And well, you know, the fan, fans are they short for fanatic, so that's you know, that, that, I believe it. <laughs> that that's nice. I mean, I, you know, they they people liked it, and they and they wanted to see it continue. And I did. It was getting it was getting good for us. I mean, as it was winding down, they were finding more and more stuff for us to do. So, I, yeah, I was I was sorry to see it go. You know, that's that's the nature of the business. So, what was your favorite thing about working on Moonlighting? Well, aside from the fact that it was a nice job for five years, I would say just, I don't know, just being part of that, being part of that family, being part of that group, having, you know, having some place to go every day, because sometimes you didn't have any place to go sometimes. It was fun. We did a, the, the shows that I enjoyed the most were the ones that we got to do where we weren't ourselves all the time. 
And I, and I think I told you before was like the uh, like my favorite was the, the Atomic Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, what else? There was a, a few others. I mean, um, the, the here's living with you, kid. The one, the, the Casablanca thing. That's a great we kept, one. Oh, I, yeah. I'm spectacular. We kept pushing to get. We wanted to be in that scene, and they and they just didn't. They didn't put us in there. Going, oh come on. But they didn't have anything. They didn't. You know, I'm sure they could have found something for the for the rest of us just to sit there. It would have been fun. But that was that was really really good. The whole the whole Casablanca thing and recreating that whole thing with the plane and and the cars driving up. I mean, the the, the wardrobe was spectacular. I, I, that was one of the most fun. That was that was a lot of fun too. And they could have easily put you guys into the nightclub scene. That would yeah. be easy. Yeah, I don't know. I guess they just didn't think of it. Uh, but we still got we still got to work as stand-ins on the, on, the, on that show. So the, you know the whole time. So you know if I wasn't in the scene, I was still working as a stand-in, which is actually stand-in pay was better than the next than you know, office staff pay. But you guys were in the bachelor party, right? And Maddie Hayes yep. got married. Yep. That must have been fun. That was that was uh, pretty fun. Yeah, Charlie was there, and Curtis, and and Jack Blessing, and God knows who else was there. It was just, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had all the regular, regular nuts were there. And, <laughs> I think uh, that's one of the funniest episodes we got. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. We had yeah. the, the, the handkerchiefs on the hand, on the head, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's Bullock. Curtis did the number. <laughs> yes, that was uh, in drag. Yeah. <laughs> How many times oh. did he have to do that take? Was it oh, like God, he just I got it, remember. or no, I'm sure he did it more than a few times because you know because you know they, they do the one big master, then they got to come in for coverage and do a close up and this, so that you know they were basically doing it for for probably a few hours. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of it did a lot of fun stuff on that show. Were you guys in the nightclub and the uh, dream sequence always rings twice? I wasn't I wasn't there yet. I think I had I missed the I think that was the third or fourth episode of the first season or, or the or the something like that um, well it's the second season um oh that's right like yeah yeah sixth episode something like that yeah i don't think i was a regular yet i was on i was on the show but i don't think i was a regular yet because i don't think i don't i wasn't at that at that scene i was not there at the nightclub which i i, I think might have been the the uh the coconut grove at um at the at the ambassador where we had our final rap party at that at that in the in the coconut grove that was that was a lot of fun too. What do you remember with that? I remember a lot of people showed up wearing periods costumes like 30s and 40s because that's basically when that was in the the heyday of its time. And it was just it was really really nice. It was a, it was a fun party. We had a lot of fun parties. Uh, a lot of the rap party we did a Christmas party on a street that was done up for little big trouble in little China. Mm-hmm. And we, so they set up all these carts and we had, a, it, they used the street as, as the, as the set for the, for the Christmas party. And it was actually, that was actually a lot of fun because it was a totally different thing that you'd see any, in anything else. So that was a movie. I think it was with um, Kurt Russell. And yeah. so I'm not, you know, I think I remember seeing it, but, the, but the scene, this, the, the, the scenery was great. And the Christmas episode when you guys sang, uh, you were were you in that the Christmas yep. episode? Yeah, when they when they opened up the walls and everybody's families and everybody. Yep, I was, we were there because we all we heard people like milling around and sort of singing, and then we came out the door, and then there's everybody there. So they said, invite anybody, everybody you want to come down here and come down and just just be in the scene, and that's what they did. So I had friends, my wife came down, all kinds of people came down, and. People brought their kids and their, you know, their, their, their mothers and their, their wives and their husbands. And, and it was just, it must have been easily a couple hundred, two, three hundred people in that scene. And, uh, yeah, that was fun because you all of a sudden you, re- you reveal the, the stage and there's all these people there. And then they, they started with the, with the fake snow. And we, we, we were seeing that fake snow for years after that because it was all stuck <laughs> in the lights. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was oh, a mess. That's funny. <laughs> You probably had to do that those that take a couple of times, right? To sing that. A couple song. times. I think. I think the big the big thing with the big crowd. I think we only did maybe once. I think there may have been situations where they wanted to get you know individual close ups of certain people here and there, and they might have done that. I'm not sure if they did that at the same time or, you know, after the big scene was done. It's possible that they had they had a couple of cameras set up, so that that could have been that could have been the case. 
That's awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much, John, oh, for sure. taking the time to talk to the fans. We really appreciate it. 